Hello guys, this is um, Sapphire Yagami with last night's episode of Teen Wolf. It's the seventeenth episode in the se- in this on the third season, and it's titled Silverfinger. The title is a play on the title of the nineteen sixty four James Bond movie Goldfinger. So, this episode starts off with Chris Argent tell with him telling a story about when he was eighteen. Gerard had sent young Chris Argent to do an arms deal without telling him that the customers were Yakuza, which is the Japanese organized crime syndicate. In the middle of the deal, a group of demon warriors attacked the Yakuza leader, uh, Kunicho. Um, it's, it's, um, I'm trying to pronounce the Japanese name. Aku, a, girl, Akumichio, Aku, Akumicho. They cut down all of his men who tried to protect him, eventually impaling him on their ninjako, their straight swords. Chris survived and saved the life of a man called Silverfinger by shooting one of the Oni directly in the face. Shattering his mask and revealing, and revealing that was nothing that was that there was nothing but darkness behind his face. He believes Silverfinger, who got his name from the silver prosthetic pinky he wears, will be able to tell them about the warriors. God takes Kira home on his bike. She asks him if all his friends are werewolf, then asks to see his werewolf face. He obliges and she touches the enhanced ridges on his forehead, his cheek, and his lips. I don't know what it is that is about movies and where um it's usually a male character and he's like a werewolf or a vampire or something. And when they're in their true form, the female always wants to touch the face. <laughs> like, I don't know if that, I, I don't know, if, I'm guessing that's the, the point is to make them closer together. You know, letting her feel your face and see that it's still you despite, you know, your glowing eyes and your big teeth and your hairy big, and your big ears. I'm, that's what I'm guessing that that's the whole point of the females always touching the guy's face. So, later as Scott is riding his bike, dirt bike to school, the twins, Ethan and Aiden, ride up and flank him. Scott races ahead, but the twins easily keep up. Once they get to school, the twins explain that they are planning to stick by Scott all day and all night to protect him from the demonic ninjas. Scott suspects their interest in him has more to do with wanting to join his pack than being than a genuine desire to keep him safe. He asks for some privacy while he brings Styles up to speed on the events of the night before. He warns the twins not to listen in with wolf hearing, implying that his status as his true alpha gives him powers of which the twins are on a rare. He seems to be making this up. In the chemistry classroom, Styles is alarmed to find that the writing on the chalkboard is gone as is the extra key from his ring. He confesses to Scott that he believes he allowed William Barrow into the chemistry closet and then wrote a message to the killer on the chalkboard. Styles has found an old story about Barrow's attack on the school bus. The killer apparently packed nuts, bolts, and screws along with the bomb in a box wrapped as a birthday present. Styles sees a similarity between this and the prank he and Scott pulled on Coach Finstick on Mischief Night. Styles says it was his idea to do the box thing. Scott says he doesn't believe that Styles is trying to kill people. Scott says Styles looks tired and needs to take a sick day. Sick day. Scott rejoins the twins and speculates that they that he may not be on the Oni's target. He looks to Kira down the hallway. Silverfinger is now a parano- paranoid recluse, but Scott has a real weapon, a French footlock turnover pistol from 1645, which Silverfinger will want to buy. He plans to use it as a distraction to get to the paranoid Yakuza to talk. Talking on the phone as he walks through the sheriff's station, Agent McCall says just a week or two away from a formal review of the evidence against Sheriff Stelinski. He says he has enough to make sure the sheriff can't get hired at any level of government. When he opens his laptop, a security warning pops up. When Scott and Kira broke into his office to erase their phone, they trigger some sort of automatic webcam, leaving a snapshot of them on the screen. Styles is at the hospital. Uh, um, and he's talking to Melissa McCall, who explains that Dr. Gardner isn't back until next week, and then says Styles can see one of the hospital's urgent care doctors. Styles, Styles panics. panics Seeing his distress, Melissa takes him to an exam room. He explains anxiety and panic attacks, sleeplessness, sleepwalking, which he said he also suffered as a kid, and blackouts. He says his Adderall isn't working and he is feeling irritable to the point of homicide with vivid dreams during the day. Melissa gives him a common drug to re- that's used to relax patients before surgery. She says he is probably sleep- he's profoundly sleep deprived, and as he is dozing off, he calls Melissa's mom. And I was like, Because secondly, to me, when I see, since Scott and him are like best, best friends, usually, I I think with friends, they get to the point where they be over at the other friend's house so much that to the point where the parents, uh, their friend's parents kind of become like a second parent to them. 
So in this him calling Melissa mom, I kind of feel like she is like his second mom, you know? Silver Finger will not meet a person to purchase the weapon. Chris comes up with a plan to have Isaac pose as the seller while he and Addison search the location of the buyer for Silver Finger. Isaac is unsure he can pull it off saying that the suit and tie Chris gave him to wear makes him look like he just stepped out of the last period of the Catholic <laughs> of the Catholic prep school. He is nervous until Allison takes him aside, kisses him, and places his hand on her buttocks. Filled with confidence, Isaac walks into the bar. Re really? So you needed a kiss and a get a little grope with get a little feel, cop a feel, before you... Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, Isaac, really? Oh, my goodness. If I ever did that, my mama would kill me. <laughs> I'm just saying, she would kill me. I think if any child did that while their parents was, like, there... I think any parent would kill their daughter for doing something. Or kill their son for grabbing. Like, really? You gonna do this in front of me? Because it's not like, you know... I mean, she was on the other side of the car, but, you know, daddy was still there. I'm just saying. <laughs> so. Back to um, Scott. Wanting to dish the twins in order to keep them out of harm's way, Scott steals spark plugs from their motorcycles. They are left behind as he rides off with Kira. Silverfinger's henchman is a werewolf, too. He offers $100,000 for pistols. Stalling for time, Isaac says he has to count the money and pulls out an automatic counting machine. But I ain't gonna lie, Isaac looking nice in that suit and tie, though. I ain't gonna lie, he look, he looking spicy, he looking sharp. Mm. <laughs> At the house, Sky rushes around, closing and locking all the windows. He explains that Dr. Deaton has installed a supernatural security system in the McCall house, but that his mom has to arm it. Kira has figured out that Scott thinks she might be the target of the Oni and that he brought her to his house to protect her. Back at the hospital, Melissa takes Styles' chart and compares it to, to, a, to one from a, a patient who died in 2004. The symptoms, the symptoms hallucination, impulsivity, irritab irritability, and insomnia, as well as vivid daytime dreaming and an ability to distinguish dreams from reality, match on both charts. The old chart belongs to Styles' mother, Claudia Stolinski. Addison and Chris systematically take out all the Silver Fingers' men. Isaac continues, continue, continues killing time by telling the story of the pistol. It was a gift from Louise of France. I'm not even going to try to remember these freaking numbers. <laughs> it has only ever been fired once doing a, I think it's the 16th. It's, it's the X, the I, and the V. I can't remember. I, can't remember. I, I suck at rubber numbers. I could go up to 10. I can't go after 10. So it's ever been fired once during a duel between brothers on the ground of the Palace of Versailles. The henchman hands over a case with fit hundred fifty thousand hundred and fifty thousand. Isaac still killing time says he still has still still have a cop of money and brings out an automatic counting machine. I said it already. Um Kira sits on Scott's bed and and she explains about a bit about the Kutsuni myth. She pulls out a children's book called Japanese Mythology, Creatures, Spirits, and Demons, and shows them a picture of the fox. Scott draws a parallel between a picture of the multi-tailed fox surrounded by lightning and Kira handling up and handling of the electricity at the substation. Kira says it's called Foxfire and that Kissini can produce it by rubbing their tails together. She's quick to add that she has no tail. Scott is amazed that she knew what he was thinking. She just said Kissini can also read minds, which is not true. They realize the sun is setting and Kira says she needs to be home before dinner. Scott says she should tell her parents that she can't make it because she's going on a date. She then questions if a relationship is a good idea since foxes and wolves don't get along. She shows them a picture of the Kusini surrounded by wolves. Sky brushes aside saying it's just a drawing in a children's book. He hears a call pull up outside and thinks it's his mom. Kira and Sky go into the kitchen but it's Agent McCall who greets them. Scott is shocked, first asking what he's doing there, and then wondering why Why the heck you still have a key? You For one, you don't even live here. Why the heck you have a key to, to our house? Like, what they do that at? Like, like really? Like, like really? Why the hell you still have a key? That's what I want to know too. If you don't, if you not, if you and this woman is divorced, why you still got a key to the house? Stalker. Then 
His father turns around, turns it around him saying that he still has the key to the house, but he doesn't think Scott has the key to his office. He shows up, he shows them the laptop webcam photo. If I was Melissa McCall, I would ask for my key back. Like, we're not together, so you, there should be no reason for him to have a key to my house. That's, that, that, that's all I'm saying. You know, if you're not together, there should be no reason for this man to have a key to your house. Just saying. Back at the um, dealing, um, the werewolf henchman, henchman stops Isaac from counting the money. He tells the true story of the pistol. Apparently, a freshman used it to kill his brother after the sibling became a werewolf. His story references a family code, which implies the pistol belongs to a family of werewolf hunters. He jerks Isaac's arm back, and the younger man goes all fangs and glowing eyes at him. Silverfinger is watching surveillance feeds from several parts of the warehouse complex. He sees the confrontation with Isaac, then swipes the screen and sees Allison and then Chris take out his guards. Silverfinger pulls a gun Gun as Chris enters, Alice disarms him with a whip chain. The werewolf henchman drags Isaac into the room. Agent McCall is demanding an answer, but Scott is belligerent, also trying to protect him, telling him to leave and come back with a warrant, which is true. You, just because you my dad, I mean, you do the bus for this house. When McCall tries to be tough dad, Scott calls him a gene, do- a gene donor, saying he gets his hair color. He he got he got his hair color from the man, but nothing else. Melissa j- arrives just as the sun sets. A demon warrior appears in the living room. Agent McCall approaches it and promptly is promptly stabbed through his left shoulder. Melissa pulls him to a secluded corner as Derek bursts in and starts fighting the Oni. The twins burst through a window together. The werewolves manage to eject the warrior from the house and Melissa drops a jar of mountain ash across the threshold. It forms a, protect- a p- perfect line which completes the security barrier Dean established at the house. The demons cannot get past. Kira reaches up and touches the screen door. It repels her hand with a flash of light, indicating that she, too, is supernatural. After reminding Silverfinger of their meeting 24 years prior, the old man explains that the warriors are owning. They are demons and unstoppable. Yeah, well, that's good to know. At the McCall house, Derek is impressed with the security, pointing out that all the baseboards must be ashwood. He did admit that he's been following Scott all day. Like, why the heck does everybody follow me? I'll be so uncomfortable. Like, really? Really? Somebody's watching me. Melissa says her ex-husband wound is bad. Her He mumbles something about calling for backup as she is applying pressure. She said that by the way his arm is rotated, the tendon looks torn and that could lead to a collapsed lung. Melissa says demons are no demons. He is bleeding out and needs a hospital. Silverfinger explains that no man-made weapon can harm the Oni. He said they are a force of nature like a tsunami. You don't fight a tsunami, he says. You endure it. And you hope you are not destroyed in this path. He explained that the marks on eyes and neck is the Japanese symbol of kanji for self. It means he is still himself. The only are looking for someone who is no longer themselves. Someone possessed by a dark spirit. All right, we're getting into possession. All right. Aiden aggressively questions Kira about her supernatural nature. He forces her hand against the screen to show that she too cannot cross the mountain ash barrier. Derek steps in and says it's obvious that she is a kusini. He explains that the young ones have an aura that they haven't learned to conceal yet. Derek says she probably doesn't know what kind of kusini she is either. Then we go back to Silver Franker who states that there are 13 varieties of kusini. He names four, Celestial, Wild, Ocean, and Thunder. And then he explains about the dark kusini. Why well, everybody has to have a, I guess it has to have a dark version of everything. If you have angels, you gotta have demons. If you got druids, you gotta have a dark variety. If you got kusini, you got a dark kusini. Um, he says they called it void or nongutsini. He explains that they possess a host a draw, and draw power from pain and tragedy, strife and chaos. The Oni seek out the nongutsini. Um, Scott is convinced that Kira is not the target of the Oni. She says she's not so sure, saying that a kusini is a trickster spirit and could be tricking him. Scott says he's seen the bad guys and Kira is not one of them. Oh. Aiden tries to explain that he wasn't going to hurt Kira when he forced her to touch the barrier. Aiden says that they are there to protect Scott. Ethan says they are there to fight for for them, for them. him. Derek is unimpressed, saying that while he is sure the twins will kill for he is not sure they would die for him. Oh, I feel so bad for the twins. They're trying so hard to prove their worth. Silverfinger, Silverfinger, Silverfinger explains why he's missing the joints of his little finger. Yakuza perform a ritual where they offer the mutilation of the little finger as penance for a mistake. He says if Chris hadn't shot the Oni when he did, Silverfinger would have fled and would have been humiliated. 
to the point of having to give up his head. He says he owes Argent his honor. He urges them not to try to stop the Oni, to let them do their, their work. The demon warriors begin pounding against the barrier, looking for weaknesses. They begin to see results forcing their way through. Forcing their way through. Agent McCall, sensing that he is dying, wants to speak to Scott. He says, he, know, he, he says Melissa knows why he came back. Melissa says his timing sucks and that she won't let him talk to their son now because they're going to get him to a hospital and he's going to be fine. Aston calls Scott and gives him the lowdown on all they learned from Silverfinger. She says they realize Scott is supernatural and they will move on once they make sure he's not the dark spirit. As the demons burst through the barrier, Scott tells everyone to do nothing. They question this order, but follow it. The only reach for Scott and Kira stare at them with their glowing eyes and brand each before letting them drop to the floor. They disappear. Styles then wakes up in the hospital. He wanders down the hall into, in, and into one of the surgery suites. There he is confronted by the Oni. He lets one get close, but as it reaches up to touch his neck, Styles grabs his hand. He then thrusts his hand into his chest and pulls out a firefly. The Oni turns to smoke and disappears. Scott's dad is willed into an emergency and Scott has to find Styles. Styles seems normal as he and Scott leave together, leave together, but on the floor a firefly buzzes. His light goes out and it first and it first crumbles to dust, then blows away with away in a puff of black smoke. So apparently, as much as I hate to think of this, Styles is the dark kusini. Why Styles? Why my Styles? <laughs> but um, but it's definitely a plot twist. But given how we seen, if if you notice, but it kind of does make sense when you go back through all the first two seasons of Teen Wolf, and you can see Styles' connection to everything that happens to be pain and tragedy, and how he's like coming so good at freaking out. I mean, he also has a dad for a police officer. I mean, that does help too. But the fact that he and Lydia kind of tend to be kind of well, you know, kind of irritate, get, um, you know, they're toward, they're toward this pain and tragedy and stuff, so it kind of makes sense. She's a banshee, he's a dark kusini. So I'm guessing that he's given, and also the fact that it also shows his, the charts of his mom, it might have been passed on, passed on to him from mommy, because mommy had the same system, so maybe mommy was a dark kusini and it passed on to Styles, even though now... Since the Oni's main mission is to kill the Dark Kusini, does that mean Styles is going to die? Because if Styles dies, I don't know if I'm going to watch Teen Wolf. I, I don't know what Teen Wolf would be without Styles. I don't know. I don't know. Or what they might do is find a way to destroy. Well, he didn't kill the Oni already, but they might come back because apparently you, they have to use Fireflies. But what they might do is probably have Styles face off with. Kira, because apparently that's who he's after. He's after the good Kusini. The dark Kusini wants to kill the good Kusini. So that might be interesting. And not only that, but since Styles is after Kira, that puts Scott in between his new girl and his best friend. Ooh, that's gonna be good. Ooh, I love drama. Anyway, that's all, that's all for the review of Teen Wolf, episode 17, titled Silverfinger. Um, so comment, rate, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next Monday for episode 18 titled Riddled. So again, comment, rate, subscribe, and also don't forget to check out Geeked Out Nation, written for the fans, written by fans, for fans. It has everything, you um, every reviews for everything, TV shows, movies, comics, video games, you know, things, uh, and other stuff like, you know, that you might want to talk about. So don't forget to check out Geeked Out Nation, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.